A big happy hello to everyone, to all the participants, attendees of the Cheat Code to Real Estate Property Cycle. Uh, I am Kevil from Credit IMCHI, and I would like to personally thank all the people who are attending this uh, program today. And uh, I would personally like to thank uh, the president of Credit IMCHI, uh, the other MCHI members, distinguished members, and the non-members as well. A very good evening to all of you. And a uh, big thank you to our youth wing to organize this particular program today. I would uh, also like to uh, introduce our co-host and the host, Mr. Ricardo, the co-host uh, Raditya Mirchandani from Mirchandani Group, and he's also the managing committee member of Creda MCHI. Uh, Binita Dalal, she's the head of uh, finance in Rustamji Group, and also a managing committee member of Creda MCHI. Uh, Mr. Naman Shah from Sri Naman Group, and also the youth wing convener. Uh, of this particular year. I would also like to thank Mr. Ricardo Rommel, who is also a managing committee member of CREDA MCHI and our, uh, what do you say, the head of this particular program. And I thank you, Ricardo, for your active participation. And I give you the floor to introduce the uh, chief speaker today. Thank you. I agree. Good evening, uh, one and all. I'm Ricardo Rommel, as Keval has already announced. Thank you, Keval. Uh, this is the uh, Akhil. Uh, we'll move on to you very quickly, but a quick introduction as to why we are doing this. Uh, there's an old saying that the past does not repeat, but it certainly rhymes. And whether we like it or not, history has a strange way of teaching us that the lessons of the future are often written in the past. Today's session aims at uncovering such lessons, and I think. Uh, uh, knowing Akhil uh, and property share market economics, the kind of research you guys have done, uh, I think you guys have a lot to share uh, for the, towards the oncoming uncertainties. Uh, a brief introduction about Akhil. Uh, Akhil Patel uh, is, uh, has, uh, is the director of property share market economics. And for the last few years, he has been working with uh, Phil Anderson, who is the author of this fabulous book, The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. Uh, it's the book is a comprehensive interplay of how markets uh, work with real estate, work with all other uh, work in the larger economic cycle, and why things go boom and bust. And it's a must read for everyone involved in real estate. Akhil himself, uh, on the academic front, has has two master's degrees from the University of Oxford in UK. One in classics, which is actually history, as we refer to it in India, and the other one is finance and public policy. He's also part of the European Bank Reconstruction and Development uh, Board, where he's the principal policy advisor. Uh, without much ado, I'd actually now move the spotlight to Akhil. And uh, Akhil, anything you'd like to uh, open up with? Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for inviting me to speak to your um, to your distinguished uh, event. So um, I just I just add a, a bit more about myself. So I'm, a, as you can probably tell, of Indian origin. Uh, my grandparents are from Gujarat, and they moved uh, to East Africa to Kenya in the 1940s, and then moved back to India to to Baroda in uh, the 2000s. And so I am somewhat familiar with India, but only a small part of it. Unfortunately, I'm not a, a very detailed expert in the ins and outs of the, the Mumbai or the Maharashtra property market. Uh, but in any case, my uh, talk today will focus on the very big picture. And I think, uh, as you said, Ricardo, it's very important that even if you're making day-to-day -day decisions based upon the fundamentals in a particular location, and you know, as real estate developers, uh, you're all doing that. Um, you need to have an eye on the bigger picture. And I believe that the framework that uh, is articulated in Philip Anderson's book on real estate, uh, as well as some of the points that I'll make today, are really fundamental to understanding how the economic system works and therefore what's going to come next. Uh, Akhil, we have a lot of questions to ask you, and most of these questions are aggregated from our members. And what we've done is, it's not we're not really a panel of uh, people. We're just trying to sort of intertwine these questions into the uh, the large narrative and the uh, and the output which you put forth. So, okay. and first of all, I'd like to ask you very honestly: is what got you to understand such a macro trend, considering that you know real estate really is a bunch of smaller micro markets 
uh, and a lot of deviant behavior within those markets. Why would there be a need to identify such a micro trend in the first place? Well, I mean, it's a really good question. So fundamentally, uh, you're right. Uh, real estate is a very much a locational asset and uh, different part, different locations do different things at different times um, uh, in relation to price appreciation and to in relation to supply and demand of, of units. But if you recall, uh, and this is where I became interested in economic cycles, if you recall in 2007, 2008, we had the global financial crisis uh, and everything went down and no one could obtain finance uh, and people stopped buying, people stopped selling. Um, and there was a prolonged period of uh, global uncertainty. Now, I've, I do appreciate that different countries experience that in different ways. Uh, and so what happened in the United Kingdom, where I'm based, might have been different to, to the way that we experienced in, in, in other countries. But nonetheless, it was a pretty significant financial crisis. So while um, it is true that there are sort of micro markets and micro trends and so on, ultimately we all are subject to the same overall economic cycle. And the reality is that after, um, you know, particularly after the Second World War, um, as economies develop, they're becoming increasingly synchronized and they go through the same periods of boom and bust uh, at roughly the same time. It's not precisely the same time, uh, but it's 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 pretty it's pretty close, uh, and so uh, those who are you know even, even if they're involved in a particular market, they need to have an eye to the bigger picture, and that's how I became interested. So I just to add that um, when the global financial crisis happened, no one seemed to really forecast it, and I thought that could not be the case that something so big had been unforeseen, and I wanted to find out why that was and what to do about it, such that. Uh, I could help, you know, my, my family's business because we have a, a pharmaceutical business in the UK, um, but also other businesses we could help uh, understand these things and, and advise them accordingly. I think uh, Phil's book did, did cover uh, Phil's book did cover that well in advance, if I'm not mistaken, along with uh, Fred Harrison's book as well. Uh, but moving on to the more poignant question, what is this 18.6 year property cycle? Uh, how was it con conceived and what was the basis for such uh, you know, radically different thinking? So um, I've been doing it for so long that I don't feel it's radical. I think it's radical not to know about it. Uh, I'll just share my screen. I'll just make a few overall sort of um, remarks about the cycle and how it's structured. I mean, you know, I could be talking about this uh, for a very long time if you allowed me to. Um, so I'm just going to give an overview and then we'll go back to your questions. So I'm going to just give a very brief overview, as I mentioned. Um, it's an 18-year real estate cycle. Now, you might think that you've never heard of it, and that might be the case, and, and it's more apparent in some countries than others. Uh, it's very apparent in the UK and the US, which have existed in their same sort of form, more or less, for several hundred years. It's less apparent in newer countries, which, you know, for example, in, in India, which until um, 1947 was subject to, you know, the British... Uh, and other countries have been broken apart over that time, they've been put together and so on. And so that has obviously a major disruptive effect. But when economies get onto a sort of pretty sure footing um, and they start to develop and grow and people become more prosperous uh, and people want you know, better quality of life for themselves, you start to see the same patterns. And essentially what the proposition is, is that there is an overall 18 year cycle it's roughly, as depicted on this uh, rather basic diagram, it has to be said, roughly uh, 14 years up uh, and four years of kind of crash and, and crisis and then recovery. And of the 14 years expansion, that's also um, it can be subdivided into two halves of roughly seven years. Uh, the first expansion leads uh, out of the previous cycle and the previous crisis into a mid-cycle slowdown, which is the middle blue bar in the diagram. Um, and that mid-cycle slowdown is often a recession, but it tends to be relatively short uh, and uh, things don't crash very significantly. And then you come out of it into a second expansion, which tends to be bigger, growth tends to be higher, asset prices tend to appreciate more quickly, there tends to be much more available credit and lending by banks, uh, much more bullish uh, and euphoric sentiment uh, and that is where things really lead over to the top, over the top, uh, to a peak, and 
then when the cycle turns down, the crisis after it uh, tends to be very uh, significant, uh, not least because there is much more leverage in the system and all of that has to be unwound. Uh, and it bring, you know, the banking system is under pressure. They stop lending to the to businesses. Businesses don't have credit. The economy contracts. Uh, when the economy contracts, people are laid off and you get a major recession. And so the recessions that you tend to get in the economy are not equal. It depends on where they take place within the cycle. And we can come on in a little bit to where we are now. Now, that is a relatively uh, basic structure for the cycle. Um, and you might think, well, it can't possibly be the case that it's always 18 years. Well, let me take you to the next um, uh, diagram, which is uh, depicting uh, land sales in the US from 1800 to 1923. Now, just a bit of history. So when the US gained independence from Great Britain in 17, well, it wasn't 1770, it was 1783, uh, the states uh, got together, they ceded their, uh, the, any claims to the Western lands, i.e. The, the lands across the continental United States, um, and they uh, and they and it was settled uh, over a period of about 150 years, beginning in 1800. And so, what you used to go do in those days is you used to go to the frontier, you used to um, mark off a piece of land, you'd go to the local land office, you would acquire title to that land, uh, and if you needed to, you'd um, have to borrow from the local bank. And what happened over the course of uh, a few years is that you know there'd be a steady volume of land sales, and then suddenly at some point there would be a massive crescendo in activity and then there would be a major peak uh, and then the uh, vo volume of activity would uh, decrease markedly and actually at the same time there would be uh, a major financial crisis so there was uh, steady activity and then a major peak in 1818 and then a financial crisis in 1819 things then recovered a few years later there was a steady activity and then a major speculative boom into a peak 18 years later in 1836 and then a major collapse in 1837 and so on again into 1854 into 1869 a land boom after the u.s civil war in 1888 and then in 1908 and after each of these events there was a major banking crisis and a relatively prolonged recession and so for uh, the first 123 years of u.s history there was this 18 year period periodicity uh, of of uh, sort of steady activity, then boom, and then major financial crisis. It wasn't just in the US. Um, I mean, this graph is taken from Phil's book. Uh, Fred Harrison, another economist who actually has been researching 18-year cycles even longer than Phil and I have, um, pointed out the same 18-year pattern in the UK uh, going back even longer. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, lend itself to quite so clear a graphic because we didn't have the same program of land sales in the UK as they did in the US. Now, what happened after 1923? Well, the frontier was closed in the US, and so there was no more kind of real um, uh, selling of public land. It was the first uh, cycle where actually all the land was enclosed. And yet, uh, even though there was the First World War in between 1914 and 1918, even though there was a major Spanish flu pandemic in 1920, sorry, 1919 to 1921, uh, you got the Roaring Twenties which was a major land boom, and probably the most celebrated boom in history, uh, to a peak in 1926 in terms of real estate. The stock market continued a couple of years longer into 1929, and then we had the major uh, financial crisis, the Great Depression, uh, and so on. The 30s were a pretty dark period. After that, we had the Second World War, and then there was reconstruction in Europe and in, in other countries. The US economy was demobilized. And from about the mid 50s onwards, and now using the proxy of house prices uh, in real terms, there was steady activity in the 50s and 60s. And then towards uh, the end of the 60s, a major rise in property speculation and bank credit to a peak in 1973, and then a major financial crisis. Now, those of you who know your economic history will say, well, the 1970s was all about the oil shock. This is one of the reasons why people don't see the cycles, because they don't attribute the right events to the right things. And actually, what it was was a land led crisis that was causing problems in the economy that was actually causing the economy to turn down, which was a key thing. And then the oil shock happened on top of that to make things worse. Nonetheless, after the 1974 oil shock and the 1979 one, things recovered and we had a pretty significant boom into a peak in 1989 
and then a major banking crisis, which no one seems to remember, um, uh, took place in the early 90s. And, and what was interesting of the um, of the activity in the, particularly in the 1980s, also to a certain extent in the 1970s, was not only were you seeing this phenomenon just in um, uh, the UK and the US, you were starting to see it in other countries in Europe, uh, in Germany, in France to a certain extent, uh, but also you were starting to see it in places that had been, you know, pretty significantly uh, destroyed during the Second World War, like Japan. And in fact, the 1980s boom in Japan uh, was possibly the biggest boom that any country has ever experienced uh, in history and of course led to a major collapse so significant that it pretty much took Japan 20 years to to get out of. Nonetheless across the world in the early 1990s things recovered then we had uh, a, a, another property boom in the 2000s to the peak in 2007 2008 depending on the country and then a major financial crisis which was the global financial crisis and it seemed that most large economies were going through the same thing uh, at the same time. And so the point earlier that I made was that what might have started out as a UK US phenomenon um, actually became a Western one uh, and is now a global one. It's not something that just affects real estate. Um, it is also uh, uh, determines to a large extent, but not the only extent, uh, stock prices. So here I've taken uh, stock market data from 1800 in the US and I chopped it up into 18 year segments and then I averaged it out and what you see through that is a pattern very similar to the fairly basic illustration of the cycle that I gave you earlier uh, so the first half expansion then a mid-cycle slowdown where stock prices don't go anywhere or they go down and go up again then a second half expansion which is more significant than a peak and then a major crash which takes uh, at least a couple of years for the stock market to recover out of. Now, this is a, a relatively basic framework, and I've, there's so much more detail that we could go into in, in the questions, but it is something that you can use to forecast. And on this slide is a, some evidence of that. So in 2004, my friend Phil uh, made a forecast to his subscribers to the service that he ran at that time. Uh, and he said in 2004, so well before the financial crisis, that uh, he expected the cycle to run its full 18 year course as normal with speculation in the US to reach fever pitch by 2007 and a credit event, in other words, a financial crisis to unwind things in 2008, which is exactly what happened. Uh, and it wasn't just Phil who said that, Fred Harrison also uh, made that similar forecast in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, based upon knowledge of the 18 year cycle. In October 2008, when everything looked pretty bleak, when Lehman Brothers had just collapsed and you know, stock markets were at least 50% off their highs in 2007. Phil wrote uh, uh, the cover story for Money Week magazine, which is the largest financial publication in the UK. Uh, and he said that actually there's going to be a recovery after 2010. And he illustrated how that would be. And then in 2014, Phil and I also wrote a cover story for Money Week again. Uh, and we said that uh, while things were recovering, uh, they would continue to do so uh, to the end of the decade and that we'd find economies slowing in 2019, uh, which is exactly what happened. Now we talk about the COVID pandemic as being the cause of the recession. In fact, the global economy was slowing in 2019. PMI data was down, um, particularly export related economies. Uh, the yield curve in the US had inverted signaling that there was a recession coming. And then of course the pandemic uh, made that uh, very significantly worse, at least for a few months. Of course, the response to the pandemic was also very significant and ensured that the recovery uh, would be uh, relatively swift. So where are we headed now? Um, well, the current cycle, uh, sorry, the last cycle ended around 2008. Then there was a four year period of crisis and recovery. So the current cycle started in 2011, 2012. Now, I actually created this graph um, in uh, 2016 just to help illustrate where things are. And I just, all I've changed to this is move the yellow dot one year at a time. And so we had at the end of the first half of the cycle in 2019, we had the mid cycle recession in 2020, and we started the second half of the cycle uh, thereafter. In 2016, I said, the way that we get out of the mid cycle recession is much looser monetary and fiscal policy, i.e. very big packages of public spending and very low interest rates, exactly what we got. 
one of the ways that governments stimulate their economies is to spend money on infrastructure is exactly what we got when you get major infrastructure spending you get a commodities boom we've had the first leg of that commodity prices are coming down now but they will recover at some point and they will follow the second half of the cycle up what we will get in the future well um, one of the one of the things that doesn't happen at the mid cycle slowdown is a major banking crisis. Banks are relatively resilient. People think all the banking regulations are working. Um, property prices haven't come down very significantly, so bank balance sheets are relatively healthy because, of course, property is a very major source of collateral for banks, at least in 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 developed um, financial markets. Uh, and so that leads to a lot of competition to lend. Uh, and so it becomes an era of very easy money, which is to a certain extent one of the reasons why the property boom in the second half of the cycle is very significant. At some point with all this, with land prices rising uh, very significantly, uh, with credit being very available, um, someone somewhere will announce the world's tallest building. It's not in, in not without coincidence that um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman has just announced this ludicrous 75 mile mirrored landscraper uh, across uh, Neom, you know, the area uh, that it shares with Egypt and, and Jordan. Um, maybe that's the thing. Maybe there's something even more outrageous coming along. Uh, but it's always announced in the run up to the peak. The peak should arrive uh, around 14 years after the start. So 25, 26. Uh, and then we will get a major financial crisis because uh, the banking system cannot keep pumping money into the property market. At some point, the economy can take it no longer. Uh, and then things start to slide. Once they start to slide, they affect the banking system. Banks start to fail. Uh, and then you get a major contraction of credit. When the economy lacks credit, uh, it starts to fall down in a fairly major way. Uh, and so you take quite a long time to get out of that crisis. And so four years after the peak uh, will be the end of that sort of crisis phase. And it's usually at that point that the world's tallest building opens. And of course, at that point, they can't find any tenants. And if you think that's a rather glib thing to say, well, take a look at history. So on the right is the Burj Khalifa, which opened in 2010 in the middle of the global financial crisis. On the left is the Shard, which is at the time was Europe's tallest building, also opened in 2011, 2012, at the end of the crisis. If you go back uh, a little bit, the Petronas Towers in KL opened in 97 during the East Asian financial crisis. If you go a bit before that, the peak of the last cycle in the Europe, um, we had uh, Canary Wharf opened in 91 in the banking crisis. The cycle before that, this is the Willis or Sears Tower in Chicago, which opened in 1974 during a financial crisis. And perhaps most famously of all is the Empire State Building, which opened in 1931 in the middle of the Great Depression, and they couldn't find any tenants. And so for the first few years, it was called the Empty State Building. So this has quite a long historical provenance. Um, it happens over and over. Uh, we've seen that we are more globally synchronized than ever before. Um, and that as economies develop and grow and sort of become more integrated into the global financial system, for example, Japan after the Second World War, they also exhibit uh, the same cyclical pattern. And my hypothesis is that they will do so at the same time. It's not a given that they follow exactly the same dates. Uh, but that's my working hypothesis. And so what we do for our uh, subscribers and our investors is we essentially track the cycle for them and we um, provide up-to-date analysis of where the cycle is from a, from a macro point of view. And investors and developers and business owners in other countries are very lucky because the US tends to lead the cycle. And so what happens in the US in cycle terms tends to be about a six months to a year before everyone else. So if you follow what's going on in the US, uh, you have plenty of advanced warning about what's going to um, happen in your own economies. So I think I will stop there. I know that you've got plenty of questions. You want to sort of relate some of this information back to India and back to the current situation, which of course, you'll tell me that um, with the possibility of nuclear conflict in Ukraine and, and uh, the fallout of the property market in China. And you also tell me that with inflation so high uh, and uh, various other things that, of course, the cycle is not repeating uh, as uh, as it has before. And, and uh, I will tell you, uh, to, 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 to spoil the punchline, I will tell you that it's ex repeating uh, with quite uh, remarkable precision. Anyway, let's go to questions. Aditya, if I could just interject, and sorry to take away. 
just to yeah. give you guys how crazy the neon tower sounds it's 200 meters tall and 75 kilometers wide and i don't think we've ever heard of something that magnanimous but on to your question ankit so ricardo correction it's 500 meters tall 200 wide and 75 kilometers i stand very much corrected <laughs> it may not you know it may not see the light of day but um at least not at least not in the next few years you know because there'll been a lot of announcements they've been talking about neon since at least 2016 and it's not exactly on track right so akil thank you so much for the insightful presentation we have a lot more questions but just to start off broadly uh if the cycle is so accurate why and it has been going on since such a long time why doesn't anyone else see it uh well the fundamental reason is that no one really studies land as a separate factor of production with its own unique characteristics um so we don't i mean you, you developers will know the price of land in your local markets but an aggregate economic level it's never really tracked and it's fundamentally a land cycle so when property prices rise it's not the value of the building that's going up i mean it might be subject to slightly higher reinstatement cost because of you know rising cost of materials but essentially uh, other things being equal uh, the cost the rising cost is the rising value of land and it's where land is speculated in that you get the cycle but of course economics doesn't really deal with land and so therefore doesn't see the cycle and actually as i as i point out in my forthcoming book uh, the reason why economics doesn't consider land is actually rather deliberate um Uh, and so it's almost a deliberate blindness in the profession uh, it, but what if you don't see land you don't see the cycle got it and uh, you you talked about the 18.6 year cycle uh, quite extensively in the presentation but today we live in a extremely super paced world world do yep. you think going forward this 18.6 year cycle might actually get compressed to a shorter span Uh well it's a good question I get asked that a lot. We do live in a super paced world but I don't know I mean if you if you think how much the world changed between for example 1837 when the first train was run and the, the end of that cycle when you could essentially cross the entire United States in three days as opposed to three weeks. I don't know if that extent of change is is less than what we're having now. So that, I think that's the first point to make. But the second is that uh, you know there is some psychology involved and it seems we need 18 years to forget all the lessons of the previous cycle um and go through the sort of the mid cycle slow down to a certain extent makes us forget because we've dealt with the mid cycle challenge which is very different to the financial crisis and so we get a sense that we're living in a new era. Um it also takes quite some time for technology to be absorbed while um you know for example one of the key drivers of the current cycle from a technology point of view is the smartphone and 4G it's really only in the last sort of 3 or 4 years that you've seen the real connectivity and the real uh, level of application that has sort of fundamentally changed the economy so some of these things take time to build and of course um it it does also take time for um the leverage to be built up in the system which uh ultimately tips the cycle over the top and and causes the major crisis at the end right um naman do you want to take the next one i think vinita had a, a important question in mind yeah so i think we can uh, come back to mine hi guys sorry um so akil i have a small question with the india ukraine war and uh, sorry the little noise where i am right now the in i'll just get back to this question uh, ricardo you want to take it up to sure think vinita so the present russia ukraine situation uh, do you think akil that it has uh, you know with it putting as much pressure on trade routes and especially oil and thereby commodities uh, we have inflation going double digit of looking to go double digit we have rising interest rates uh, yeah. do, you, do you do you think this like do you think uh, rising interest rates is a way to control inflation and and what's your overall view on all the disruption going on right now uh, well it's very disruptive there's <laughs> no question about it i mean i don't want to give the impression that the cycle only happens when things are okay because if that were the case there's pretty much no two decades where everything's okay i mean i know that we haven't had inflation like this necessarily 
uh, for a long time, but we did in the late 60s and 70s. Um, we have had a cycle where there was a world war in the middle of it uh, in the 19, you know, between 1914 and 1918. We've had a cycle where there was a major, much worse, more significant pandemic, which killed tens of millions of people, which obviously had a huge impact on demographics uh, between 1919, 1921. We've had US civil war. Uh, so we've had all sorts of things. The cycle has endured through all of it. Um, do, do I So do I think that some of these uh, variables will affect how the cycle plays out? Of course they will. Of course, the cost of money and the cost of capital affects real term business decisions. You know, what people build, where they build it, how quickly they do it. But ultimately, what it doesn't do is uh, it change the incentive to speculate um, and make money out of, you know, real estate speculation, speculation in assets, uh, and so on. Um, and, and that is ultimately what drives the cycle. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it might happen when fewer people are fully, you know, kind of exposed to the real estate and the banking sector. Sometimes it's maybe more global when everyone is involved in it and, and somehow through, say, securitized lending, you know, even large pension funds are exposed to it. So the circumstances in which the cycle repeats uh, might change, but the fundamental drivers do not. Uh, I mean, the only way that probably it would stop is if we all became communist and and uh, economies and, and weren't allowed to own anything and there was no pricing mechanism, there was no sort of functioning banking sector. I think that those are the only circumstances when the cycle is, is really interrupted. So I'm not, that, there's none of which is to downplay the seriousness of the events and the difficulty it might make to certain businesses. Um, but from a macro cycle point of view, uh, it doesn't change anything. Hi, Akhil. Uh, good evening, Namanya. How are you doing? I uh, uh, just wanted to really quickly, uh, you know, uh, since you touched base on banking, wanted to understand what is the relationship between banking and real estate and how do they interplay within the cycle? Yeah, this is a good question. So, thanks for watching. Want to know more? Join our Property Cycle Investor newsletter. You'll get exclusive access to our new uploads on YouTube. Watch the next part here. Click here to watch our other videos.